Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that we're gathering uh, today on Darkajung country, country with a 65,000 year history of art, culture and storytelling. I pay my respects to elders past and present and wish to warmly and sincerely welcome any First Nations audience members who may be here with us this afternoon. So the title of this session is indeed Blue Notes. Um, I hope we can keep it a bit more upbeat than blue. Um, but the description for this session was um, we're going to sit together and immerse ourselves in the worlds of two tender, utterly original memoirs, um, both of which uh, riff on memory, grief, the father figure, and the redemptive power of music. Um, I had the pleasure of reading them both, um, and they're a wonderful uh, mix of coming-of-age memoirs with some really incisive writing about art, culture, um, music, and both touch um, on some pretty huge um, and important legacies um, of Sydney, uh, Australia, and our modernism as well. Um, so, Bertie Blackman is here with us. Um, Bertie is a multidisciplinary storyteller. Her work as a writer, musician, and artist is highly imaginative, weaving between the real and unreal, illuminating her unique universe and inviting us to explore worlds within worlds. Bertie is also an aria winning musician and is the daughter of the iconic Australian artist Charles Blackman and her memoir is The Beautiful Bohemian Negligence. Um, closer to me is Jonathan Seidler who is a writer, creative and cultural critic. His work has been published frequently in The Guardian, City Morning Herald, The Australian, Monocle and GQ. Jonathan co-founded long-running music website One A Day, launched two nationally syndicated fiction series for Broadsheet and recently commissioned, edited and published the Unyoked Anthology of Nature Writing. Uh, you might have heard him as a regular guest on ABC Radio National's Download, this show, uh, discussing media, culture and technology. Um, he once played drums in bands, but now sticks mostly to his garage. And his book, actually is right there, uh, is the wonderful It's a Shame About Ray. Uh, and I think this is the third or fourth event um, Bertie and Jono have done together. Um, they're part of a group called the Sad Dads Club, I heard. Um, so this is, this is part of that tour. It's not the end of the tour. They're up to Byron Bay next. So they know each other very well. I don't really know why I'm here. I think they could do it by themselves. Our records are at the back. If you yeah. Want <laughs> um, but I just wanted to start really with the bare basics because, you know, I think we'll get into, um, you know, what is inside these books. But in some ways it could be quite terrifying to sit down and write these books. I just wanted to know what got you to the very starting line of deciding to um, write these books for both of you. Boredom is amazing and I highly recommend it. I was in London, uh, it was 2018. I had not yet met the woman who had become my wife and I had not yet gotten a job. And I was trying to figure out ways to fill the day and I used to go to the same cafe every day in East London and sit there with a notepad and force myself to write a page every single day. And I was trying to write something completely different, but these stories about my father and both Bertie and uh, my books are obviously about our fathers, in amongst other things, kept coming out. And, and I really do attribute boredom as a, as a primary driver to how this book came about. It's much more interesting than that, but that was it. Um, death is mine. It's a good name for our album, Death and Boredom. <laughs> yeah, it's a hardcore... Um, a lot of my book does hinge around my relationship with my father and I th had felt like writing this book for many years but it wasn't until he passed away that I felt like I probably could give myself the space to grieve that relationship and probably curl and ponder through how that felt and what that meant and like what the words would feel when I wrote them down. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, they're both obviously memoirs um, and they have sort of different approaches to writing memoir. They're very, very, very interesting memoirs, both of them. You know, Jono, you mix in a whole bunch of cultural criticism and pop music history um, and Bertie, yours have these, you know, is, is constructed out of these really beautiful, sharp um, vignettes that almost work like short stories that sit on their own. I'm wondering how you landed on those approaches and, you know, what you were thinking in terms of style and format when you sat down to write. Um, I did basically write this book as a series of vignettes and halfway through writing it, um, my agent gave the book to an editor friend of hers and there were some questions that came up on, 
you know, he was leaning into the fact that the chapters didn't run next to each other, like, chronologically, and was that something that I was doing on purpose, and how did that feel, and did I need to flesh things out a little more? And I thought about that a lot as I... Um, yeah, it was kind of... I really just didn't want to feel like I had to flesh out the book for it to be a chronological piece, and I think when I finished writing it, 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 it does just still feel like vignettes that way, and for whatever reason, they connect but they don't connect and I think that that's how memory feels for me it's how my story feels to me and it felt like as authentic as I could make it that way yeah mine's kind of similar and I think the more the Birdie and I do our grand tour the more I think about this but we're both part of a culture that involves I think music you know especially in Birdie's case um, and the way in which we consume culture is not linear anymore. And the idea that people will watch shows from beginning to end without watching anything else like we used to because we used to have to tape it and it was once a week and, you know, all that kind of stuff. My mum, like, I think taped over her wedding tape with SUV at one point. <laughs> but you don't do that anymore, right? And you will, like, be watch reading something on your phone while you're watching something on TV while something else is happening in the background. And, and that is the way in which we ingest culture, which doesn't necessarily mean it's any more or less poignant than it was 30 years ago. It's just how it is. And similarly to Bertie, I had written a version of this book and given it to a friend of mine who was an editor, and he sort of questioned the, the way it was arranged and why it was arranged and actually pushed me further towards a non-conventional narrative and, and, you know, more tight chapters that uh, only really came together at the end and you could really see the thread happening that way. Um, but it was also the kind of books that I like to read. And, and I felt like in Australia, particularly when probably both of us were writing our books, there wasn't a lot of that stuff happening yet. And it's really exploded now. That really unconventional approach to narrative has become very normalised, which is fantastic. But at the time, a lot of that stuff that I was reading was American. And I just really wanted that to come through from an Australian perspective. Yeah, cool. That actually like is literally my next question. because oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, perfectly set up. Um, Music and timing. Um, I did want to ask, like, what you guys were reading. I always find memoir is such a, like, porous genre in terms of, you know, taking on influences. I think it's a really important genre to read widely in. And were there particular influences or books that you were consulting when you were writing your books that you were sort of aspiring to, you know, connect with? All right, all right. You go. Um, we've worked this out. We've done this before. Uh, <laughs> this is part of the show. Uh, I was reading a lot of Ocean Vuong. Um, I was reading a lot of Patricia Lockwood, um, who is a, an American author who I really like, and a lot of Daisy Johnston. Um, now, I don't think most of those were billed as memoir, even though quite a few of them were, and that's what I found really interesting, that line between what is a memoir and what isn't. I typically read fiction. That's the thing that I kind of ingest at a massive rate. Really, really, I love it. You know, I just read as much as I can. And so I remember when I brought this to my publisher and she was like, and we're going to have to write memoir on the front. I was very resistant to that because it was just not something that I understood. I thought a memoir was like, you know, a cricket player from 1974 or whatever. Uh, that's, you know, or a, an, an ex-prime minister. I was like, what am I doing? I'm 35. What am I doing writing a memoir? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so it was interesting, like, I was reading a lot of stuff that, again, had unconventional narratives that played with language that was really intertextual, and that was really beautiful to me, but I wasn't necessarily reading a ton of other memoirs, if that makes sense. Yeah, I made a conscious choice to not read anything <laughs> while I wrote this book, um, because I really didn't want to... I think I can... Uh, I think, you know, as we, like, glean from things around us, you know, cultural bowerbirds and we're just so like overly saturated by so many things all the time I wanted to kind of take the space with this book and be really quiet and I guess re-feel those things and not kind of feel like well you know I think I would get further away from my writer's voice or my child's voice which is what I was really deeply trying to search for but when I thought about writing a memoir one of my favourite memoirs is written which is Patti Smith's childhood called Wool Gathering I think or Wool Gatherers which I thought like, for me, also, when I thought about memoir, I was like, well, I'm hopefully a third of the way through my life, which I'll be very old when I die. Um, <laughs> not grim. Like, this is not a grim yeah, panel. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and I was like, well, why am I doing this? What is it for? What could make it interesting? Like, you know, is my... I don't really think 
my life's that interesting, maybe other people might think so, I don't know, but for me, like, my childhood was very interesting, I think. It was a very weird childhood compared to others. I only found out it was weird when I went to other people's houses. It was normal to me at the time. But I thought, you know, and every time I'd go to dinner parties, I would end up, you know, telling my childhood story sometimes and, you know, people would find it pretty unbelievable. So I thought I should write it all down and explore that space. Um, I do want to get into, like, the, the what the books are about, but I do love this kind of, you know, sort of writing vein and I, I just wanted to ask in terms of, like, your professional backgrounds previously, it feels like musicians, you know, can pretty naturally move into writing. I mean, the, one of the biggest memoirs to sell over the last, you know, little while is Crying in the H-Mart, the Japanese breakfast memoir that's also about loss and, um, and grief. I'm wondering if you found it easy in terms of moving from making music into writing or it was something that you were doing before and then, Jono, maybe your criticism background and street press and all that kind of stuff, like moving into a longer form writing. Yeah, I... It felt very natural for me to do it. Um, just feels like a longer song, really, um, with less metaphors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, it was surprising to me. I, you know, obviously, uh, writing is hard, and also writing is wonderful, and writing can feel easy and liquid. And I treated writing this book the way I do my songwriting, and I write at weird hours where my consciousness and my subconscious can kind of be as leaky as it possibly can without you know in, so for example I don't write in the middle of the day I write in the middle of the night or very very early in the morning and so I just kind of put the same practice into place and then the book just came out which was great we are the opposite oh my god <laughs> um I only write in the middle of the day um because I, I, I'm not awake anymore we should share a studio <laughs> yeah we should share a studio 24 hour studio um for me, I think I started as a journalist and then I kind of moved into advertising. And what happens when you start as a journalist is that you, you, know, you get uh, 1,500 words for a feature, if you're lucky. And then when you start writing music reviews, they become 600 words. And then the newspaper cuts out half of those reviews and it becomes 300 words. And then it becomes, give me 150 words. And then it becomes, just do it right? At the Nike slogan, not just do it. But uh, what happens is you have to become shorter and shorter and more concise and more punchy to get your point across because you're in an attention economy and everybody has to get everything at all times. So for me, it was more difficult because I then had to expand that out to this, which uh, what I thought would be more difficult than it was. But what I also found was that a lot of the skills that I learned as a journalist were really good when you were writing for an audience who likes to ingest things in a punchy way, who likes to watch Netflix half an hour episodes, you know, three of them in a row and then be done. If you can write short chapters that get to the point really quickly, that's quite a useful thing. And I had an interesting uh, a conversation recently with another author who's got the same publisher as, as I do and she's written her second manuscript which is 160,000 words and mine is my next manuscript for the next book I'm writing is at 50,000 words and so I'm trying to go up and she's trying to go down and I asked her if like she could lend me some words and then we could kind of meet in the middle but that's you know I think some writers are really just they're amazing at just getting so much down on the page and you could see that in the way that they write but I think, particularly from a journalistic point of view, being able to make that concise and kind of hit people every single time, that's a different skill which was quite useful. Yeah, cool. Um, so to get to the heart of it, I suppose the, the reason that the Sad Dads Club is on tour and, and that you're being put on a lot of panels <laughs> together um, is both of your books obviously, um, you know, confront your fathers. Um, there's a lot of grief uh, and tragedy in there. Um, and that was the kind of thing that made me feel I could never write a book like this. It just seemed like an insurmountable task to me um, to reflect on these legacies. I'm wondering how you went about that in terms of putting putting these stories in the book. Talking about writing about my father's legacy? Well, I think that's a different book that someone else should write. Um, but I think... I think the, I don't know, the shadow or the breath of legacy is an interesting thing and I think that um, I've been told that I'm a lot like my father so maybe I explore his legacy a little bit through just the work that I make myself. Um, and I think, you know, the, the book that I've written is written from the point of view of me as a child of that age, you know, so I, I didn't really think 
about his legacy a huge amount when I was writing the book, but his legacy is within it. And, you know, um, people have made some comments ab about, you know, my stories or about talking about him in the book and that they, you know, felt like it was a privilege to hear some, you know, more intimate um, uh, words about, you know, who Charles Blackburn was as a, as a man and, a, and as a father. Um, and I guess that's nice for them too. But, you know, it's my story. So, and here's just my dad. Yeah, yeah in my case, um, we had a bit of a philosophical drama going on in my family. My father, not to ruin the book, but my father died by suicide. And we were trying to contain that piece of information because my father was a GP. There were a whole lot of dramas wrapped up in whether his patients were going to know or not know. There was a lot of shame, hence the name of the book, uh, associated with having that happen in our family. And so my family sat on it for years, uh, at least five. It probably This came out at close to 10 years after my dad died. And the, you know, the way in which I negotiated that was essentially I felt like I had unfinished business with my dad that I needed to get out there. I was also in the process of becoming a father myself for the first time, so I was thinking about that constantly. But also I felt like we needed a document, both as a family but also at an external level in our community in particular, and I guess the general community, about how we deal with these things and how, what happens afterwards, you know, because I think a lot of the books that I had read in which suicide featured, um, it was always the end of the story. It was when somebody's life was over and thereby their family's lives were over and it was just a disaster and nobody ever came back from it. And for me, I felt that was quite damaging. We had managed to move through as a family unit. We had done really good work. And I thought that that, if, if I had been in that position, 10 years down the line, I would have liked to have read about somebody else who had come through that and, and actually done all right. Um, so I thought it was important, I guess, on, on that level as well. And also my dad, I think, just really wanted to be famous, so I just made him <laughs> you know, inadvertently after his uh, posthumously famous. So good. Well, it's, you know, like, I think it's right to say that these aren't just books about your dads, obviously. They're from your perspective and, uh, you know, and as well, there's other family members in the book, and I wanted to maybe get a sense of, you know, when I wrote my my first book was a memoir, and I remember sitting down with my parents, telling them I was doing it, and my mum said, "I don't want to be in it. I don't want your brother and sister in it," and that was fine because they weren't. <laughs> um, my dad was, but uh, yeah, they weren't, so that was fine, uh, and I wasn't going to put them in it anyway, but. In terms of negotiating with other family members, I think in both of your books, you know, and particularly once you get to the acknowledgements, obviously, but there is a dance around, you know, writing about your other family members and, you know, you've got a shared person that you're writing about as well at the centre, so. Great. Um, I told no one in my family I was writing this book because I didn't think it would be published. I thought it would be a thing that I would write for myself and get out of my system and that would be fun. And then, so 39, in addition to being in a band together, have the same agent, obviously, because we're in a band together. And uh, when I first got my agent and I realised that something was kind of cooking, I remember saying to my family, this is this thing that has happened. I might get a publishing deal. That might happen in January. So you have the summer holidays. To air all of your grievances. Tell me anything you don't like. But, like, after that, we're done. Like, if you don't want to be in it, tell me then. You know, I just kind of wanted to give it that really short period of time because I do find I'm from a large family. Once you get everyone in a room and you start talking, it's fucking, it goes forever. And <laughs> I was just not interested. I was just kind of like, read it. It's going to be really confronting for you to read. I want to hear what you, th what you think about it. But I also want to know if you are, like, actually not okay with being mentioned in it because that's a serious thing and you need to get approval when you are getting that stuff published. Um, and I really, I was very worried about, in particular, my mum and my sister, who both have, like, chapters devoted to them from their perspective in this book. My sister was... The sister chapter is just, like, one of the best things I've ever read. It's, like, oh, this thank you. very incredible, intense scene in the middle of the book yes. that is and a turning point as well. Yeah. yeah, and she was 16 at the time, right? So when my dad died, she was 16. And so she's now 26 and runs her own business and whatever. But, like she doesn't necessarily want to relive that. She doesn't necessarily feel the way that I felt about it because I was 10 years older than her witnessing that at the time. And I was convinced that she was going to cross it out, that she was going to say, absolutely no way are you putting this in this book. 
And in fact, it was the opposite. And I think what I learned from that experience is that if you are very honest about what you are trying to put across and why you're trying to put it across, you would be surprised at the reaction that you will get. And, and I went in with such a mentality that but at least half my family were going to say no. I was just convinced I was going to have to strip half the book and start again. And it just wasn't the case. So that was really lovely. Also, because I didn't want to write any more of this book. <laughs> yeah, I also did not really tell very many people that I was writing my book. I did tell my mother um, and had subsequently many, well, just a few conversations with her, probably for her, but also for me, preparing her to read the book because um, I was kind of describing to her, I was like, there will be a lot of things in here that will be difficult for you to read, but also just that you might, your memories of them will be very different. You might, you know, chronologically it might feel different for you, but I on purpose didn't really speak to any family members or fact check or kind of do anything because I wanted it to be as true to the memories as they feel. And I think it's good I did enough prep work with mum that when she did read the book, she did respect and didn't kind of come to me and go, that didn't happen. I was just like, you know, as a person that has been through, like, sexual assault as a child, the worst thing you could possibly do is say, that didn't happen. So for me, I was frightened that that, that would happen. So that was kind of a difficult thing to relegate and live through while writing this book. Um, but yeah, I, I did not give anyone the choice to read it. I made sure it was basically published and like looked like this. And then I gave everyone a coffee and said, enjoy. <laughs> I should have done that. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> well, I did want to talk about like putting yourself out in front of, you know, as the face of these books as such or, you know, and coming and speaking at festivals like this because I just do remember this story. I used to run a writers festival for like young and emerging writers and we went onto the radio once and I took a young memoirist and I was quite well known ABC personality um, and he was like you know had obviously not even read the producer notes about the book let alone have read the book and he said tell me about your novel and um, my friend said oh, it's a memoir and then this guy on the radio took one second and said oh so your brother actually died then and it was just I got out of that studio and was like, that guy's a fucking dickhead. Um, but in terms of, like, putting yourself out there, those things can happen. Like, you can get weird responses. They're really, you know, like you're dealing with some very sensitive material. Did you feel confident in terms of, you know, jumping out in front of writers' festivals and on the radio and those kind of things? Well, I think it's been challenging. I think, I think with the content of my book and also, Jono, your book too, you know... You kind of like write these books for a reason too, like you hope that it can start conversations about these very difficult topics that will give other people agency to tell their stories and if things like that have happened with them that they can tell someone and talk about it and, you know, find help in some way. Um, but yeah, there was, I think I've had one interview where someone hadn't read the book, which I thought was really strange and it was, I just, it was a weird um, internet radio station and felt like M Good Morning Australia and they were like what? why did you call it Bohemian Negligence? And that was like the only question I got but otherwise <laughs> so it was just very strange but otherwise people have been like generally very respectful because of my father is quite famous a lot of people really love to talk about him which is fine too because he was a very interesting man so happy talking about him I adore him um, but yeah you know challenging in its own set of ways yeah, I haven't found the, the media writers' festival stuff so difficult. I think what I didn't expect was regular people read the book having an extremely strong reaction to it and then telling me about it, like, in, ex like in extreme detail. And, and that has essentially not stopped since the book has come out and you don't get prepared for that. No one prepares you for that. Um, it's... It's extremely weird. It happens at all hours of the day. Like, not like all every hour of the day, but as in you will wake up and a 58-year-old woman from Perth will have emailed you about her brother who committed suicide and how she read your book and, like, and has given it to her whole family. Or you'll get a call from someone. I mentioned a band called Lincoln Park and there's like a fan club in the States and people found the book through the fan club and they all ordered it. To the, you just have no idea how this stuff's going to happen. But like, it's a lot of... Um, 
like transmission in terms of, um, which is a weird word in COVID times, but uh, it, it's like people taking what's happened to them and transmitting it onto you because you've, you've opened yourself up and you've given them that, that, that doorway. And it's really useful and I'm really glad that I did it, but I probably would have prepared myself better for, I guess, uh, having those conversations with people one-to-one, -one, often anonymously on the internet, which is, again, something that's relatively new in the grand scheme of things, uh, as a result of a book that you wouldn't think would have anything to do with them. Um, and that's a really good thing, because it means it's hitting a wide range of people far beyond the audience that you thought it was going to. But it's also very, very challenging. Um, and I think any author who is in this realm of sad dads club or sad clubs generally um and memoir particularly about you know memoir in particular where it is your life just realize that it takes on a life of its own which every book does but it's your life and that's a very different thing yeah no totally i feel that um in terms of putting yourselves in the books i guess you know like you're both obviously in there and it's from your perspective but you've got your own own stories and just wondering how you fit yourself in because Jono there's some amazing stuff about your bipolar disorder and the diagnosis and you know you've taken the reader through that really sensitively and then I guess um, Bertie is you know like choosing that childhood perspective and really sticking to it like it's amazing feat to just like you're so in the voice of that child through reading the whole book until you kind of get to the acknowledgements or the epilogue I'm wondering how you kind of figured on that perspective and putting yourself in this in this kind of larger story. Yeah, I just, uh, I think like, yeah, when I went to tell this story, that is just the voice that came out. I didn't give it a huge, and I, I was uh, really specific about ending the point, uh, ending the book at a, just before I, I guess I turned into a teenager until, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, look, innocence gets lost at, younger than it should sometimes but you know when you you start to kind of think about things more as a young adult I thought that probably the tone of the book would change a lot then and, and you know my feelings about things that had happened would also change so I kind of wanted to keep it as pure even though obviously I can't remember exactly what happened when I was you know when some of the first memories where I described like the my first memory which is like this blurry chalky ghosty color red which is a strawberry and it when I told my mum, you know, that was my first memory, she said when she first fell in love with, her fa with my father, he read her this poem, which is about strawberries. So it's just like a lovely, smoky kind of link. And so I, anyway, I've gone off topic. But anyway, anyway, like, yeah, I'm a child at heart. That's it. It is amazing what Bertie does, by the way. I could never, like, incredible. When I read Bertie's book, it just blew my mind because the, the ability to write like that consistently is, like, for me, impossible. So I was amazed by that. Um, in my case, and I think this, again, comes back from a journalism perspective, you are told very, if you work in soft journalism, which is not um, Ben Robert Smith, um, you, are, you, are told, you are told very quickly, like, to find your voice and that people will only care about you and you will continue to find work if, if your voice is recognised and people can kind of attach themselves to your voice, particularly as a critic, I think. And so I learned very quickly to hone in on that. And when I was trying to write this book, I think when you fall into that voice, and uh, obviously Bertie's was more childlike, but mine kind of like veered between criticism and, and I guess fiction or non-fiction writing, um, you just you drop into this flow where you just know that it's working and everything that doesn't feel authentic to that voice has to go uh it just becomes you you'll write chapters or you'll write you know long pages of stuff and you just look it back at it and go like that sucks that doesn't feel like me that doesn't express the point that i want to express in the way that i want to express it and and i really do thank journalism for that big ups to journalism um because that's not something that everybody learns. You know, some people, like, everyone learns that eventually if they write a book, but some people, it takes them an extremely long time to learn that, and I think I was very, very lucky that I had other people beat that into me uh, at an earlier age because it just became something that I ruthlessly judge my own work by. Um, obviously, both of your books are about, you know, they contain traumatic information, you know, traumatic life stories and, and those kind of things, but I, they, they both really reminded me of this great... Um, Carrie Fisher quote that is, um, if my life wasn't funny, it would just be true, and that's unacceptable. <laughs> and I think you both work in humour in different ways, 
um, and to different levels into the book. And I, I wondered about finding that levity and making sure there was a bit of humour in the book to create relief for the reader so that it wasn't tr just true. <laughs> yeah, I um, actually wrote all the really difficult bits of the bit book first and then I just floated it up, you know, like in between certain chapters. I, you know, because there were lots of things that also didn't make it into the book, lots of other silly, ridiculous, insane things that happen. But I think too much of that would have uh, kind of left the more serious things um, lonely. So it was a, it was a t type, quite tricky to kind of get the balance right where, you know, you get the, the difficult parts in there, but also like the, the light and the shade, which is very important for my story. It's very important, like just how I write in general. I love exploring those two places. And I think if things are too, like, you don't want to, like, <laughs> when you talk about child abuse, you know, it's a, a horrible thing, you know, and it's, and reliving that and then writing about it is incredibly difficult. But, you know, colouring something like that to make it approachable to lots of people is something that I really wanted to do and thought about in you know, very deeply, so it's not like so awful that you just want to put it down and just crawl into a hole. I, like, I wanted to find not humour in those moments, but humour in other moments, you know, kind of telling different parts of the stories to kind of give light to the dark, which, you know, makes it hopefully a readable book, not like something you just want to just go away and crawl into a little sandpit after you read it, you know? I agree with that. Um, I think... I think we all know people where you have conversations with them and you ask them how they're going and it just immediately goes like this <laughs> and you're standing talking to them and you're like, how do I get out of this conversation? Like, oh, you know, blah, 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 I was in hospital and I broke my foot and, uh, and the weather's terrible. And it's just like we are both talking about grief, we are both talking about extremely serious issues, but you can't stay down there for that long. It's just, it's not helpful to anybody. And also you don't get anything out of it. Like all you get is like, oh, here's a horrible thing that happened. Horrible things happen to people. Let's move on. Like that's just not, for me, that's not a useful tool. Um, my brother's a psychologist and he always said that humor in particular with men is a really good way to cut through difficult issues because men historically are terrible at talking about everything. Um, and I think when you are talking about particularly like depression, grief, suicide, that kind of stuff. I wanted men to read this and not like put it down because they were bored or it was too hard or it was, you know, that kind of stuff. And I remember the exact moment when I realized I was gonna write about going to my dad's, um, my dad's grave on the morning of my wedding. And like, it's a very serious, like very hectic thing that I did, but I got lost on the way to the cemetery, like multiple times on the way to the cemetery. And like an ordinary person would be like, that's not the story. The story is that you went to your dad's cemetery. And I wrote this whole bit about like doing multiple U-turns in the cemetery. Like I'm Jewish, I was in the Greek section, like just trying to figure out where I was. And, and that was, it was that kind of thing where I realized like that's what you need to be able to balance those two things. Yeah, cool. Um, this might be a boring question, but obviously the timing of the release of these books probably means you wrote them during COVID and during lockdown as well. Like, did you have any, were you staying sane during that process? Because writing a book can be isolating enough, let alone doing one during lockdown. In my defence, I started writing this book when the bushfires were happening. So, yeah. And I was also pregnant at the time. So, I was in my own little lockdown. A lot of existential dread. Yeah, I was like, quickly, quickly, write it. Before. That was a more interesting response than you thought you were going to get. <laughs> So, yeah, I did write some of this book in COVID, but I certainly didn't write it because of COVID. I know lots of books, and thankfully, have been written because of COVID, because, you know, more stories we have, the better, in my opinion. Um, but, yeah, no, not a COVID book. Mine either. Obviously, I started it before, but then I got locked in my house for a year and a half. <laughs> and um, I, I, I think... Uh, Creative people have this idea, and it depends what type of creative person you are, but the type of creative person that I am, have this idea that you can't do creative work in your own house. Like, you've got to be in a cafe, looking out of a window, listening to this music. <laughs> and I subscribed to that wholeheartedly for years and years. And, so I never did any work in my house, right? And then I, I couldn't leave my house. And I was halfway through this book, and 
it was either a situation where I was going to drop it or I was going to finish it, but I didn't have another room to go to because my wife was actually working in the other room. So it got to the point where I would have to sit at a desk while she was watching, I think it was RuPaul's Drag Race, and write these, these really traumatic <laughs> chapters about my life. And, and it was an amazing realisation that you can actually write anywhere and, and putting limits on yourself and, and having a lot of those options taken away from you actually can make for better writing. And that was a, now I write in the hour that my child is asleep. That is the only time I write and I get the best work out of it. And it was such a good, I mean, COVID was horrible for any number of reasons, but that was a really good lesson for me in the grand scheme of things. I, w I don't think I would, it would have taken me a year longer to finish this book, I reckon, because I would have been like, I could go to the pub. <laughs> or I could do this. What do I want to do? And now it's like, well, I can't go to the pub and I don't want to do like takeaway margaritas for the 15th time. So this is it. Yeah. Um, Speaking of creative people, you're both obviously incredibly, extremely creative people. And I did want to mention, you know, and talk about, you know, the kind of extra literary elements um, to these books. Um, you know, Bertie, you've got these incredible line drawings through the book. Um, Jono, there's, you know, music seeps through the book to the point that there's a Spotify playlist that you can do a QR code on in the back. Um, you have recently remixed the book for the Sydney Writers Festival as a live show. I just, you know, I, I, I want to ask about how you brought that other part of yourself, but also that kind of creative energy that maybe we don't normally expect from, you know, the stereotype of the writer kind of sitting there. Um. <laughs> I think like a bit of, I thought that some punctuation and probably a lot of grammar problems were in my book. So I, even the way I said that sentence was incorrect. So I decided to uh, draw instead to, because I also, there being a huge amount of reflection and exploration of memory, sometimes I couldn't quite describe how it was in words, or it just words really quite weren't quite cutting it. Um, so I decided to draw as well. Um, and I know when we were um, kind of thinking about finding a publisher for this book or finding a space for it, also people kind of like to hinge on the art factor with me. So it could have very easily become like a coffee table book with drawings and little stories that go along with it. But you know, I was like, I want to be, I want to be a serious writer. I want this to be a book. So we'll put the drawings, like some of the drawings at the front of the chapter that are just a, an extension of the language itself. Um, and that was a really beautiful thing to do and I really felt like extra things were articulated that I wouldn't have been able to articulate otherwise. And I think, you know, kind of breaking down different ways that you can write or express or create anything, there should be no rules yet there always are. And the publishers like, you can't do this, and, you know, record companies, you can't do this. But, you know, we try and do them anyway as much as we possibly can and kind of squeeze them into this, like, rectangular shape, our lives and our feelings and our passions and our movements. So, you know, I did it the best I could in my, I think mine's like 40,000 words. Do you know? How many thousands are in your book? Thousands, a couple of thousand. Um, I think also artists and Bertie's an artist and I'm a person who works with artists and pretends to sometimes be an artist. Like, artists are hustlers, right? Like, we have come off the back of, not to get too political, but we've come off the back of a government that has historically hated the arts to an extent that it was underfunded and almost stripped entirely in this country. And so, like, particularly performing artists and professional artists have had to find multiple revenue streams by which to survive. So I think the idea of making a coffee table book out of a regular, like, what a brilliant idea. I would have thought... I don't know why I thought of that. But um, for me, uh, in my book, there's so much music in it and a lot of that music is not necessarily music that everyone in the audience uh, knows or has heard before. And I think I, I write about music for a living um, a lot of the time, but I also know how evocative it is to actually hear it. And we live in an age in which that is extremely possible. And so I had a similar thing to Bertie where I would say to my publisher, I want to do this. And they say, you can't do that. And I'd say, let's try. Um, at one point, I wanted to make like a digital version of this book where when you were reading about the songs, you could actually listen to the songs at the same time. Um, and I had like a three and a half month battle with Apple to do it and then eventually they just couldn't be bothered. But I think, uh, you know, creative people are always looking for ways to elevate their art and do more interesting things, which is not to say that the work itself isn't interesting, but how cool is it to say, like, I've got a scannable part of my book and you can just listen to it along, 
it's good because most people only realize that at the end, so I'm glad that everybody's realizing that now. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a nice thing to be able to do. I want to be interested and excited about it. You know, that's why I like to remix the work and do different stuff. You don't ever want to be standing still, I think, when you're a creative person. You find that quite, I get very tetchy when that happens. Um, so being able to say, like, it's not just the book, it's also the playlist. It's not just the playlist, it's also the show. It's not just the book, it's also the drawings. It's where else do we go with it. Yeah, cool. So we'll, Words on the Waves, get the remixed um, book in 2024 that we can all look forward to. Yeah, definitely. And also, we will obviously combine our books into a multi-book. It's going to be a, it's a, it's a musical. Yeah, Birdie, I can, <laughs> Birdie will Sad draw my book. Blue notes. And I will perform Birdie's book exclusively on drums. It will be amazing. I can see the drawings being projected up there. It all works. The stage is ready. Um, We're good. We're ready. <laughs> that's a challenge to the festival organisers. Um, <laughs> uh, before I hand over the questions to the audience, I just love these books so much that I'm now in line waiting for the next thing and I did want to ask what's next. Are we getting another, another book or another something? Well, you're writing a book, Jenna. You told me. You've written so, one. You go first. This is how this works. <laughs> um... I'm always working on multiple things, but yeah, I am starting work on a new, which will be fiction, novel, and a screenplay, which will be horror. So it's the next step for me, horror. I'm excited about that. The next step for everyone is horror, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, I have uh, just finished my first novel, which I'm very excited about. Nice to not write about myself anymore. Uh, and I, am, I have commenced my third, so. It's fun. I really like it now. I want to do this all the time. <laughs> That's good. Well, you've got one reader who wants to read whatever's next. Um, if there's any questions from the audience that you'd like to direct um, to our wonderful guests, I think there might be microphones that can be handed around as well. There's one up the front. Jonathan, this is for you. Um, you said you had a battle with Apple. How did that turn out? Did were you able to put music into... That was very unfair. It wasn't really a battle. Um, no, no, no. So, essentially, all these services are free, right? Much yeah. to the chagrin of artists around the world. But, yeah. essentially, what happened is I was trying... I had this idea, which is incorrect, which was that Apple owns Apple Books and Apple Music. And so, I went to Apple Books and said, Hey, see those guys? You own them. Oh, can we put them together? And they said, Of course we can. And then, it, I mean, they just couldn't be bothered really. And it was just me essentially continuously getting on their case, trying to make it happen, and then saying it's impossible. And then Dave Grohl's book came out, and it turns out it's entirely possible. I just wasn't famous enough. Great. Okay. <laughs> yes. So in the digital, it is possible to have a digital version where you can click on a link and go to a whole song or just 10 seconds for the... It depends if you have a subscription or not. So that is essentially how... I mean, it's the same with everything, right? You read a third of an article and then you pay for the rest of it. But if you are hypothetically an Apple... I'm not giving them free press. No, uh, essentially, yes. It depends if you're a subscriber or not. If you're a subscriber, you can listen to the whole thing. And that was my idea, was that you could immerse yourself to the point that as you are reading about a song or a piece of music or an artist, you're hearing it at exactly the same. Like, that is my ideal. Like, I often do that when I'm reading... Too. When I read about music, I try and look it up and listen to it at the same time. But there's a handoff when that happens. You put down a book and you pick up a phone or whatever it is, and I wanted that to be seamless. Um, didn't work. Next book. <laughs> there's this one right here. With these stories that you've obviously discussed with your families that you're going to produce, uh, you were talking about the effect afterwards Jonathan, on you and people asking you questions and, or sharing their experiences which you weren't sort of prepared for. The same must have happened to the family. Yeah, absolutely. So That's a how very did good they question. cope? Yeah. Uh, most of them fine. My sister has had an extremely hard time, like to the point where we're discussing a potential TV adaptation of the book and my sister is like, no, nah, not coming near it because... I think, again, her friends were in a particular... You know, I just think when you're very young, uh, you get this weird thing, this 
this reflex or whiplash where now her friends are in their mid-20s and they have this intense guilt about what they could have done, which is nothing, right? Absolutely, like my friends couldn't have done anything either at that point, but them in particular, they were so enmeshed with our family and they had no idea what was going on. And so they're just constantly talking to her about it and, and she's finding that really difficult. And that's been probably the one downside, I would say, for me, and that we've had to negotiate together and kind of figure out ways to get through together, is that she's found that really difficult. My mum's having a great time. She gets to talk about her son having a book. I mean, she doesn't care. <laughs> There's a question right up the back. I'm curious what band you're in. <laughs> Me? I'm not in a band. But you were? No, 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 I was in a band. It was terrible. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> Birdie is the musician here. Talk about, talk about real musicians, not me. We should have music while people go to the question. No, well, actually, I did want to ask, you know, like, because because of the Spotify link, yeah. were you listening to a lot of music while you were writing? I do this weird thing where I like program a specific set of songs and then I just listen to them compulsively. And that's how I drop into writing. And, it, and I'm doing it now as well. And I just never listen to anything else. So it'll be like four or five songs and I'll just listen to those for as long as it takes me to write the book and then it'll be done. So they're getting a lot of money out of me, whoever they are. <laughs> Any music while you're writing? Uh, no, just silence. For me, death, deathly silence. Sorry. And it's absolutely fabulous. Thank you. I think one thing that we haven't kind of discussed here is about who your dad was and if you don't mind exploring that with us because he was such a fascinating human being. Okay. Um, yeah, so my dad uh, was Dr. Raymond Seidler. He was a GP in the King's Cross area of Sydney. Um, and in addition to that, he was a big proponent of addiction medicine. So he got to the cross in the early 80s, I'm pretty sure, um, at exactly the same time as heroin kind of exploded um, in, in Sydney in particular. And he was a big advocate of um, harm minimization and worked really uh, closely with local and state and federal bodies to basically uh, find ways to look after people who were, uh, addic or, you know, who were dealing with all kinds of addiction. Um, at one point, he was dealing with trying to get people off cigarettes. That was his big thing. Um, but he dealt with a lot of homeless people. He dealt with a lot of addicts um, and he and a lot of elderly people as well and um, just kind of like worked across the whole spectrum um, of, of health and medicine. He also uh, treated a lot of other GPs for mental health, which is hilarious given the circumstance. I mean, it's not that hilarious. But, um, uh, yeah, he... He was a big kind of community figure um, and, you know, I think that that was a big thing as well is like this book is kind of also for his patients who I felt like a lot of them didn't really get any closure. Um, he died, they heard that he died, they didn't really find out how he died. I wrote five obituaries and didn't mention it once. Um, and then, you know, we kind of went back to work and that was kind of it. And they kept coming because they had always been coming to our surgery and that was what it was. And... You know, I think my brother first wrote a piece about what had happened with my dad because he was a, a psychologist and is now a mental health expert. Um, but what was really interesting is up until that point, none of them had any idea what had happened. And it was really, really, really hard for a lot of them. And you're talking about hundreds of people, families, you know, any number of people. So I think in that way, you know, this book is kind of, a, it helps them as well because it helps them grieve in a way that perhaps they couldn't. And a lot of my dad's patients and other doctors from hospitals, um, from conferences that he went to. That, I mean, there's one at every one of these, yeah, at least, if not more. So that's been really lovely as well, is that I get glimpses in the same way that Bertie was talking about with her mum and, and talking about her dad. You get glimpses into parts of people's lives that you didn't necessarily know. So that's quite beautiful as well. I fumbled my legacy question in a way because <laughs> I wasn't 100% sure what I was asking in my head. But um, in terms of like where these books fall, you know, I think in terms of, I'm fumbling it again, but I just thought in terms of like, you know, not necessarily what your fathers would think of these books, but in terms of the legacy of like, you know, your dad would have had a lot of monographs published. And Jono, I think there's a sense in this book that this is almost, you know, as close as you could get to a version of 
the book that your dad was sort of writing, you know, reading, you know, dictating in the basement. Um, you know, he was publishing a lot of letters to the editor, which is, a, you know, these great kind of comic moments about your dad's writing in the book as well, like how you think these sit in terms of time, I suppose, where they're, where they're coming out. No, no, that's you. I've talked for ages. Yeah, I, I still... I don't know. I think that, you know, my dad was a beautiful and wonderful writer and there's lots of poetry that's in the front of a lot of books that have been published, um, you know, about his paintings and kind of about... a little bit like about his life or like, you know, um, when he would have uh, exhibitions in the programs and things like that. And I think that... You know, in the, his last two decades, te decades of life, he suffered from really from dementia. So I, I do think that at some point, I would hope he would have written a book because I would have really have loved to have read it because my memories of him and even when I read his words now are so beautiful and visceral and sharp and funny and just amazing. You know, um, and you know he painted with his words and that's what yeah. he did. But he was also very very very, very wonderful with his words and that's how he spoke He's in very, his life. He was a very like literary painter as well, like the Alice in Wonderland series, obviously, like that kind of sense of childhood and, you know. Yeah, and like Edgar Allan Poe, like huge, huge reader, um, Colette, you know, the list goes on and on and on and he would take great inspiration from great writers that he was obsessed with and kind of um, expressed a lot of the romance of those words and the romance that he felt about those words and then how he expressed that in the love in his, in his life and the love in his work. Um, and there are some um, chapters in my book where I talk to watching him work and kind of do that little dance. There's that lovely one of going to the printing press yeah. and, like, and starting no. your own drawing practice as well. Yeah, and being a sick child and kind of being in there and this is what and etching presses and this is what it is to do this and you know him watching him draw and I get re realizing that this is what he does for work too like he kind of leaves his studio and he goes to another place and this is how you can also like make prints and this is what I could do if I wanted to do that you know like beautiful so lucky that I got to experience something like that but yeah I mean talking to that legacy we see my siblings and my whole family have ended up in one way or another we can't really escape the drip of the paint in some <laughs> <laughs> <our> family. <laughs> There's the other, you know, this is such a big canvas book in terms of all of the family members, not, but not just your immediate family. This was the other kind of legacy question that was in my head. It's like, mm. there's another famous sidler in your family and he does make an appearance towards the end in a kind it's of... It's me, scene. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there's another one as well. There's a third. Um, I might go swimming in the pool designed by this guy once a week. Um, <laughs> I don't think you designed that. No. But, um, oh, no, you did. Yeah. but there's a sense of, you know, you go as far as imagining, you know, your grandparents' life in Sydney and um, Harry Seidler's, you know, interactions with your grandparents. I'm wondering if that sense of, you know, that comes towards the end of the book, but it made it in, you know, like you're still painting this really big portrait. Yeah, I think history was a big part of my dad's life. He was kind of obsessed with it. He was like looking us up on very proto versions of what you can now do with the spit test to find out how you were related to people, you know, 15 generations ago. But he was always kind of really interested in that. We're a post-war family. My grandparents both came here, all came here from Europe um, after the war. They lost mostly their entire families. So it is about kind of tracing that back. I think having a document that shows the relationship of families over time is really important and it's something that we take for granted but doesn't always happen. And I think, you know, just to your point before about legacy, um, I still have, I'm very lucky, I still have three living grandparents who are all in their 90s and are all cognizant. And so I have a direct relationship with my grandparents and will remember them if and when, you know, they pass in my 30s, in my mid-30s, which is, like, amazing. My daughter will never meet her grandfather, right? So that's a really weird, strange rip in the continuum in which I, like, my, my daughter has great grandparents but doesn't have grandparents, and that's extremely strange to me, and this hopefully fills some of that void and answers some of those questions that were not answered to me about my grandfather who had also part had also passed away before I was born and I was having to like piece those things back together so hopefully when my daughter is old enough to say why is my name Ray where does that come from 
she will be able to find out. And, and that for me is a really nice thing to be able to do. Yeah, great. Um, this is one of the greatest moments of my life because I just totally saved a question that I destroyed <laughs> earlier and I got the answers that I was looking for to the question that I didn't know how to pose. Join so the band, you're in. It's a, the phoenix rises. Um, I think there was, was there another question down here from the audience or any other audience questions? You can ask it twice, you can, you know, rework it later on. <laughs> Bertie, I've noticed the cover of your book has a rabbit. Oh, yes. Can yep, you talk yep. about the rabbit? <laughs> the rabbit? Let's have a look. Oh, yes, it's still there. That's good. Um, that is a drawing that I did of my father um, when I was writing this book. I think there's a poem in there that I kind of write about secretly kind of watching him. And uh, that was what he looked like at the time through my little kitty eyes. And to me, yeah, he was very much a mixture of texture and something of another world. So, yeah, that's him. And probably a bit of me in there too, for me, yeah. Well, I think we can thank our amazing panel for that really <laughs> wonderful insight into sad dads. <laughs>